Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Uh, my name is Papa Miedemski. I'm director of the Polish Institute of International Affairs. Uh, and I'm uh, uh, honored and uh, pleased to welcome uh, all of you to the last uh, panel, to the last plenary session of, of the Belvedere Forum uh, devoted to the future of Europe. Um, and um, um, it's a, th th that's uh, um, a privilege to welcome and introduce to you a really great panel of experts, both practitioners and theoreticians, um, uh, who'd help us to determine to, uh, the, what exactly the future of uh, Europe um, uh, would mean and should mean, uh, what kind of Europe and what kind of future is ahead of us. So uh, let me uh, uh, introduce to you, uh, starting from my far left, um, Minister Konrad Szymański, um, Minister, Poland's Minister for Europe, uh, a cabinet member. <laughs> then uh, last, less left-oriented, um, uh, Olaf Oshica, um, Director uh, for research and development, uh, spotdata.pl. Welcome, Olaf. <laughs> then, uh, Sir um, David Lington, uh, Minister for the Cabinet Office and former Chancellor of Dutch uh, of Lanchester, and the Minister of State for Europe at 2010-2016. Welcome, sir. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And last but not least, uh, I would like to welcome and introduce uh, to you Sofia Gaston, Managing Director of British Foreign Policy Group. Thank you for, uh, for <laughs> being with us. So uh, let me to start our conversation, which uh, um, is supposed to, to last you know, one hour, 15 minutes. So uh, we need to have a quick uh, session of, uh, of Q&A among members of the partners, and then I'll open the floor for uh, your questions. Uh, let me start from, from Minister Szymański. Uh, and that is a very simple, or simple question uh, to you, Minister. What kind of Europe uh, we should expect to have in 2030? And uh, how we are going to achieve this vision of, um, of our preferable uh, um, shape of, of, of Europe? What's your policy uh, behind it? I think the uh, second part of the question is much easier than, than the first, because the first, the, the, the big question of the future of Europe uh, is really complex. And we, in fact, we can't say too much about the future, because we have a lot of questions already on the table, uh, serious questions about the future of the, of the continent, but also the future of the European Union, which is somehow a different thing. But uh, the future of the Union is, of course, basic for the future of the continent. Uh, and the um, uh, predictability, uh, I think, has gone from the European politics for some years, uh, both at the national level but also uh, uh, at the EU level. It's, it's, of course, very uncomfortable for politicians because we used to believe that, especially in the 1990s, uh, early 2000s, after the big enlargement, we, we used to believe that the integration process is semi-automatic, that the output legitimization is so strong that any um, negative remarks somewhere around the process, we heard that remarks, uh, but we underestimated the nature of the negative sentiments about, uh, uh, around European integration. We underestimated the result of the referenda in the uh, Netherlands, uh, in France, and in Ireland. We underestimated the result of the national uh, elections. We underestimated the nature of Brexit process. And now we are underestimating a kind of Brexit logic which is present in many countries. To, to be honest, the, the conventional truth in Brussels is that Brexit is uh, accidental. It's, uh, um, it's a mistake, of obvious mistake, and, and in fact, a kind of accident. It is, uh, to my knowledge, it is not true. Uh, and uh, what is worse for European Union is the fact that this Brexit logic is pretty present in, in some other countries. We hear it 
Right now, during the debate or uh, negotiations, quite a tough conflict, in fact, around the European uh, budget. We used to also believe that our concept of development uh, is so attractive to the rest of the world that will be duplicated, voluntarily duplicated by, by others, on the south and on the east. It didn't happen, as we know. Our borders are less secure than it was in 2005, 6, 7, and so on. So we have a lot of problems. And uh, what we would like to advocate for as Poland. First of all, I, I wouldn't like to reduce the, uh, the question of Europe only to crises. We, st we should remember that it's still second or, or, or at least third economy of the world. It is still a regulatory superpower with an enormous potential to create uh, a world of the future. Uh, two examples, the, the data protection Industrial data flow, uh, reach regulation. It's a good example where the regulatory power of unions, somehow so, soft power, but it's not so soft, to be honest. Sometimes we feel it is really hard, um, is, is something, is an asset. Uh, so we have at least two uh, bigger assets. So we shouldn't reduce the, the, the question of Europe to crisis only. But we should remember that without a proper answer as to the question of the future of the internal market, which is not clear because protectionist um, tendencies, uh, superstitions uh, are present, not only in one or another country. Uh, they are present even in the European Commission. We have to answer to, uh, for the big question of our responsibility for the outer world, for our neighborhood. It's not only a question of neighborhood policy itself. It is also the question of the enlargement policy, which is in crisis, to be honest. We know why. And of course, Poland is not responsible for that crisis, just opposite. We want to, to break this crisis. We want to, um, to show the way out of this crisis. And the third aspect is, of course, the, the very present question of the future of the European budget. Because this discussion is not only about money. This discussion is also about the readiness to contribute to this project. And this readiness is uh, fundamentally limited in countries which would like to present themselves as most pro-European. Sometimes they are uh, trying to judge uh, ourselves in terms of a European conscience. It is, uh, it is really a big paradox, I would say. So without the proper, fundamental, clear answers about the future of, of the market, uh, future of our uh, foreign, let's say, mm, um, maybe not policy, but foreign influence, how we want to interact with the outer world. And uh, without the proper answer for the question on, on budget, we can't uh, show the way how to see the European Union 2030 as a healthy, efficient, effective, and in the end, attractive institution to avoid the situation where we will face another exit in, in, in 10 years. Thank All questions are on the table, and, and we have to be very careful with the, with the future predilections. Thank you very much. This uh, uh, initial intervention leads me to um, Sir David. Uh, we've had about three, four things which um, um, would determine the future of, of, of Europe, future of European Union. You were responsible for British policy towards the European Union for, for a while. Uh, are you still interested in, uh, in these developments within the European Union? Of course, you are not in, uh, anymore involved in the budget negotiations. That's a good thing. Uh, but probably the less uh, uh, a good thing is that you are not so much involved in discussions about the foreign uh, and defense policy of, of, of the EU. So how this debate within the Europe may shape uh, British uh, response to the question uh, about the future of the continent? Well, I, I think, I think um, the starting point is that geography, history, geostrategic interest, economic interest mean that you know, the relationship between the United Kingdom and the European Union is going to remain of prime importance to political leaders in both jurisdictions. Um, I mean, you know, a lot of this conference has been spent talking about the economic relationship. I think that if you look at the geopolitics, um, the, yeah, I mean, us leaving means that we haven't now been able to put a break on some of the, um, the moves, I think, may risk blurring the lines between 
EU and NATO responsibilities, I think, would be an error. But, but no, leave that to one side. You, know, you look at what the, can you talk about a European, you, you know, with a capital E, security, a defense and foreign policy position, unless the UK is involved in some way, when you've got one of the only two countries in uh, Europe that has actually got significant forces and the political will to deploy them if needs be. Um, and you're talking about a country that is um, permanent member of the, European, uh, the UN Security Council, G7, G20, NATO. Um, our departure means that the High Representative has lost, I think it's roughly a fifth of her uh, military capability and a quarter of her diplomatic yep. capability, aid, etc., etc. Now, I do not believe, having been a strong Remain supporter of the referendum, I do not believe that um, uh, the UK can or should seek now to rejoin under um, Article 49. I think to do that from scratch is uh, going down a cul-de-sac. Um, loss of budget rebate, obligation to take up the euro. So I just, yeah, it, and it's going to be too early, too raw um, to think about that. Now, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years time, my two prior questions are, right, what will the UK look like and what will Europe look like at that stage? And while I'm a very strong unionist and believe that the union could and should hold together, the, the UK union could and should hold together, I think it is in peril at the moment and how um, the Johnson government handles these negotiations will have an impact on the debates in both Northern Ireland and Scotland about the future of the UK. Um, so that's one issue, set of issues needing to be settled. The other is what's going to happen with Europe. I agree with a lot of Conrad's analysis. Um, as I look at it, so if you're like a friendly outsider, um, if the Eurozone wants to survive and prosper, then it's going to have to integrate uh, fiscal and economic policies more closely to fit with a common currency uh, and common interest rate and monetary policy. If you're going to do that, that is going to require some sort of political institution to hold such decisions accountable. Um, and you know, so if France and Germany, perhaps under different German government in the future, decide to bridge their differences and move in that direction with a compromise, what then happens to those uh, full EU member states who are not members of the currency union? Because you then start to see divergence within the category of EU full membership. And I do find myself very intrigued by Macron's talk about circles, because it seems to me that the language coming out of the Elysee about circles is not very different philosophically from some of the thinking that has been happening in the UK for many years about variable geometry, about a more flexible Europe. And if one f went forward from the immediate difficulties and you thought of a Europe in 15 years' time where you could accommodate that divergence between tightly integrated Eurozone <laughs> members, full members of the EU who are not in the currency, um, where then does the UK, Norway, Switzerland, Iceland, dock into such uh, a structure of European cooperation. Does that then provide you with the framework for the Western Balkans, given that France has, seems to have given up on enlargement? Does that provide you with a new way of thinking about the relationship with uh, Ukraine and the other Eastern Partnership countries? So I think that is the sort of thing it will take us forward. My last point is this. One of the unlooked for consequences of the 2016 referendum in this country has been the emergence for the first time ever of a very strong, vocal, predominantly young pro-European voice in uh, UK politics. That's never existed before. Those people are likely to, given the, the demographic, to grow as a proportion of the electorate. And therefore, it would be a mistake to think that UK public opinion is simply going to turn its back on, on Europe and lose interest in Europe for the future. Wonderful. Thank you very much. This, your last point leads me to Susan, because uh, in your research, you, you, you try to determine these factors which um, um, uh, the changes in the society, which influence the, the uh, uh, foreign policy and uh, uh, elites, because you know, foreign policy usually has been perceived as an elitish thing. Uh, not for the common people, 
um, some kind of the mystery should be uh, or, you know, around it. So um, uh, what would be your response? What we should expect, uh, what, what kind of changes we should expect within the societies which may have an impact on uh, how Europe would look, look, would look like in, in 10 years' time? So I think it's great that we're talking about the domestic uh, within this international context, because as you say, that's something that hasn't often uh, been as big, uh, as prominent in, in the conversation. And I think if we really look at all of these broader forces of destabilization and dysfunction um, in the liberal world order, a lot of that is reflecting domestic, social, and political constraints. So I think it's really important for the foreign policy community to have a better understanding about the social dynamics in play as well. And it is also true that um, public opinion about foreign policy is becoming more politicized. Now, what I mean by that is that, uh, as you said, foreign policy was something that citizens were happy to actually sort of defer to their leaders. They were the salience and knowledge and interest and engagement was, was much lower than other policy areas. Um, I conduct social research, public opinion research um, into a range of issues, but also foreign policy and views on kind of global issues of importance. And what we're starting to see is that uh, people are becoming more interested in foreign affairs, global issues. They feel they have a stake in them now as well, and that they are becoming fused along these broader axes of polarization that we're seeing in society. So this huge sorting effect. And you can see that here in Britain, these views about the world, our role it, within it, uh, what we care about, thing, you know, how much we care about things like climate change, how our attitudes towards immigration, multilateralism, membership of NATO, et cetera, et cetera. We're starting to see this very clear sorting and um, quite a distinct gap growing between these different segments of the population to the extent where it is difficult to actually conjure a sense of consensus around not only issues of importance, but also who our allies and our foes are, for example. And these have been actually incredibly important tools of governance uh, domestically for political leaders. If you think about the Cold War and so on, this idea of this common enemy actually served an incredibly important domestic social function. So I think that if we're thinking about multilateral governance, um, multinational governance, and of course the EU is a sort of microcosm of these challenges that the West is facing more broadly, um, you also have to think about the challenges of governance within those nations. And I think we are living in a time of a great democratic experiment because we've never before tried to conjure liberal democracies that are so diverse, and I mean that across a very wide spectrum of levels, um, but also so empowered. And this does present opportunities, but also deep, deep challenges, and we are sort of muddling our way through. Um, I've just done a big study of public opinion in Europe across 13 member states, and uh, some very consistent themes came up. And these are the sort of battlegrounds um, that the EU and its institutions are really going to have to get their heads around, uh, thinking about the role that they can play in, I think, facilitating governance in member states and also the role in which they can play to kind of bring that all together and be a force in the global world to champion and respond to some of these issues. And just to quickly run through those, I mean, uh, very in a rud very rudimentary level, you've got this kind of division between this nostalgic sentiments, nostalgic narratives, and more future-oriented visions. You've got intergenerational conflicts. The conflicts between generations are some of the most acute around these very sensitive issues, you know, immigration, national identity, culture, values, etc. Uh, there's also gender-based conflict. In the survey, you can see very distinct public opinion between men and women on quite a lot of different issues. And then, of course, you've got this sort of support for the established principles of democratic governance, representative democracy, and uh, those who are sort of clamoring for a more kind of direct popular style of, of, of democracy. And what's really important to note when you're looking across the EU as a whole is the, even when you see common trends, the, the manifestations of those and 
the, the causes and the factors that have led to them are very distinct. Of course, these um, nations all have incredibly distinct historical and political contexts. Um, but I should note as well that there is a very clear distinction between what's going on in Central and Eastern Europe and what's going on in Western Europe, and that in many cases, the trends are just in complete reversal. So in Central and Eastern Europe, it's actually the older generations who are more likely to defend what we might call liberal democratic values, and actually the young who are calling for kind of more disruptive um, and, and even sort of more, um, I suppose, illiberal, less progressive stances on a lot of social issues. So pulling all of this together is a very difficult uh, challenge, but I think that the first step uh, is for the EU and its institutions to get a better understanding, a better handle of what's going on domestically in each of its member states. Thank you very much. Um, so now we have um, European Union perspective, British perspective, the perspective of, uh, of uh, changes which are uh, occurring within the societies uh, uh, in Europe. So we need yet another one. I mean, um, uh, there is a lot of uh, um, uh, discussions uh, around the world about a uh, new era of um, um, you know, big powers rivalry in which Europe uh, would not play um, the role it used to play. I mean, a kind of the um, a center of power uh, which um, can influence the outside world, but would rather be um, a, a victim of this uh, um, uh, rivalry. So that leads me to, to, to Olaf Oshita, who um, uh, writes about these issues extensively uh, in Poland. So how uh, this rivalry may shape uh, you, uh, the future of Europe uh, in the 2030 horizon? Thank you, Sławek. Thank you for having me here. Well, let me start with, on a positive note. I guess in uh, Europe 2030 is still going to be a one of the best places to live in the world, I think. This, I hope, I believe, will not change. Also, London and Warsaw will be one of the best cities just to live in Europe. Uh, but then, just to answer your questions, I guess there are three main uh, issues, of course, and when you talk to Europe 2030, we may come up with a number of issues, so I, I take it as a sort of intellectual exercise or provocation. Uh, the first thing is that uh, it's going to be Europe without the UK, which means that Europe will be much more continental. By continental, I don't mean geography, I mean mindset, I mean a socioeconomic model, uh, and I mean uh, growing, or I would say not only growing, but the key role of Germany. I mean, it may sound well, strange because we already have a problem whether we, we have a, to what extent do we still have a, a European Germany or German Europe? I mean, there are different people in different you know, angles. Uh, different cities answering these questions uh, differently, but I believe that you know this is this is one. If if I were to find one of the main major strategic effects of the Brexit is the role of Germany and France, of course, in shaping this new continental Europe. Second thing is, of course, you mentioned us, US. I'd say that uh, Europe uh, will be uh, strategically more alone. By uh, by uh, uh, which I mean that well, the US will be a close political economic partner but less of a strategic ally. And this is the fact when we follow the American debate, uh, 2013, and so it might be, uh, it won't be Trump, uh, but it won't be somebody, someone else, but I, I mean, whoever takes the White House uh, uh, in the end of, the, of, the, uh, of this decade will, uh, will have a different uh, sense of what is the US leadership, what is the American responsibility, and, and part of the problem is that Europe will be uh, 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 some would say, well, in some capitals, less dependent on the United States. From our point of view, we'd say that uh, we, we will not have this sort of American presence in Europe that we would like that we would like to have. And the third thing is uh, China. I guess Europe will be still confronted with a more and more political and economic pressure of China, plus uh, uh, migration from the South, from Africa, and from the Middle East. Yeah? So when you put those three things together, and as I said at the beginning, we may have another uh, variables, but if you follow those three variables and then you try to juxtapose them with you know, what, what it means for Poland, I would say again it means three things. I mean, first of all, without or with or without Brexit, it doesn't matter. I mean, Poland is facing uh, a strategic challenge actually to adapt to new times. Yes, I mean, there is a lot of, I mean, for those who 
follow to some extent Polish debate. There is a lot of self-complacency in Poland because of the economic success, because of the political success of the last 15 years, EU membership, NATO membership. But I guess this self-complacency is one of the problems which we are having in Poland. And this is what will not only will have to change, but this will change because of those issues I mentioned before. And it takes, when I, when I mean you know that Poland will have to adapt to a new situation, again, I mean three things. I mean politically. Uh, it's a question of, you know, what is the place in European politics? Some people say that, well, because the UK is living, so in relative terms, you know, the uh, Polish, Poland's position just, you know, goes up. I think it's a false idea. I mean, of course, in relative terms, when you look at the numbers, it might be true, but in uh, absolute terms, politically, Poland will, ha will have to fight strongly, actually, just to secure its place. And then there's a question which is... Uh, seems to me will be pressing, although we avoid this kind of discussion, is of course the question of Euro, and you mentioned to that to some extent. But thinking of Euro not only in economic terms, but actually just, you know, what kind of, you know, Euro and the political standing of Poland in the United Europe, you know, provided that Euro is still, that Eurozone, you know, persists till, till the end of the next decade. The second thing has the economic dimension. I mean, the Polish economic model based on relative, you know, well-educated cheap labor force is exhausting. Everyone knows that. So the question is, you know, what comes next? And I think this is, this is the, the, the moment when we are actually ending the period, realizing that, first of all, the labor force is not as cheap as it used to be, I mean, no longer. And secondly, that, well, the education is also not as good as it used to be. To give you an example, I mean, we're talking about, well, like the you know, future of you know, the European economy. It will be, to a huge extent, a digital part of it. And there is the European Commission, DigiConnect, publishes every year the so-called uh, Digital Economy and Society Index. And when you look at the numbers, Poland is at the far, far end of the scale. Yes, actually. So when it comes to digital skills, Industry 4.0, all sorts of issues which are pressing and which are present in the UK debate, I mean, there is a lot of we have to catch up, just to be ready simply not only to secure our growth, but actually just not to lose, uh, not to lose our jobs to other countries like perhaps Ukraine or some other countries. Yes? And the third issue is, uh, of course, uh, security. I guess one of the, I, 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 I haven't mentioned Russia, uh, and I did it uh, uh, deliberately, because I believe one of the key problems which Poland is facing is to switch its uh, foreign and security policy discourse towards security of the citizens from the defense of the state against Russian aggression. And this is something which is, I mean, it takes time. But when you look at those, all those issues we are discussing, like these days, like coronavirus, uh, you know, digital issues, you know, migration, you see that actually, although we have in our minds, you know, the Russia as the key threat, I guess the, the Russian threat uh, is going to lose some importance and significance for Poland, which will be good because this is the only way actually that we uh, remain somehow interoperable with the with the key of the mainstream political European discourse. So to close up, I mean. Uh, the question is, of course, what, what does it mean for the UK-Polish relationship? Because we are the Belvedere Forum here in London. I'd say it's very much on the, I mean, the, the, the ball is in the British card. I'd say it's very much on, on, on the British side. If the relationship between EU and, or between the UK and EU is going to be, as uh, I guess it was Prime Minister Johnson said, a Canada-style relationship, mm -hmm. then it's going to be a Canada-style relationship. I mean, we like Canadians. They're a member of NATO. Uh, <laughs> But they're far, far away, not only in terms of the distance, but also you know, mentally, economically, and politically. If, on the other hand, you know, the, the UK decides actually to strike a good deal for both sides and remain as close as ally of the European Union as possible, then I guess there is some window of opportunity that, uh, that this is not the last time that we're meeting here in this place. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much. And after this initial um, interventions, I would like to open the floor for your questions. And in the end, I would like also to come back to the members of the panels to, uh, and give them the chance to have a last word. Um, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, um, take some of uh, issues raised by other members of the panels. So the floor is open. Um, is Robin, prepare your questions. Be, be, be as brief as possible. I'll be, I'll be quick. I just saw people were hesitating maybe after lunch and digesting all the good comments. Um, a question for our Polish interlocutors, especially the minister. Um, Brexit or Britain leaving the EU 
has opened up the prospects of a form of European integration that may have more concentric shape to it, levels of integration that may spill across from EU membership to, in some cases, countries that are non-EU members or applicant members, or some maybe even that were former members. Um, Poland may or may not join the Euro at some point. It may therefore be in a different space within the European Union. Turkey in the future, who knows? Ukraine in the future, who knows? I suppose to our Polish interlocutors, I'm just wondering as we're talking about the future of Europe and the future of the EU and the future of Europe, do you, if you're looking forward five, ten years ahead, do you see uh, the EU progressing down one track or do you see it perhaps over time having a slightly more flexible approach to integration that may provide docking stations for countries like the UK once we're past this very difficult stage of negotiation. Obviously to our British counterparts, if they want to take this on, do you share any of those views or think they might be practical or attractive? Uh, I will take two more questions if there are. Thank you, my name's Vernon Bogdan, I'm from King's College London. I mean, is the central task of the European Union integration or ever closer union, or isn't it the task for which it was set up, namely to secure peace in Europe originally to integrate a revived Germany within Europe. Now Germany is no longer the main threat to European peace. The main threat comes from the Western Balkans. So isn't the main task of the European Union now not to secure further integration, which is arousing nationalist feelings in many European countries, including some at the centre of the project, but to create a roof over the hostile nationalities in the Western Balkans, such as the old Austrian Empire tried to do, failed to do, and create a European perspective in that part of the world. And from that point of view, shouldn't every effort be made to reverse President Macron's decision not to allow the countries of the Western Balkans into the European Union? It seems to me a powder keg. Uh, I would uh, add my own brief own question, you know, uh, exactly uh, going in the line of, of uh, the last question that was posed. I mean, uh, how should we think about the idea of enlarging uh, uh, European integration? Um, should, be, should, should it be a, a, a part of, of um, our uh, plan for, for Europe in the next uh, 30 years? What we should do? to keep this uh, um, a project uh, as inclusive as, uh, as possible. Because that was uh, the strongest European magnet uh, for years, that there are those uh, living uh, on, on our uh, close proximity wanting to become one of us, uh, members of the same club. If looking at the map of Europe, it's pretty clear that the Western Balkans is a missing aspect of the European integration. It's pretty clear and historically proven that we need enlargement in this part of, uh, of, the, of Europe. So the enlargement crisis is a, is a very strong illustration of uh, crisis itself. Because if we can't even open the debate, even open the process, which is absolutely controllable, it is not a, a process which would be automatically, which would lead us automatically to the very end one day, and we would have no say about the, the outcome. It is, of course, not true. If we can't even open the negotiations, it means that our political readiness, our political effectiveness uh, is very, very limited. And we should be very serious about this case. I hope we will fix it uh, during the nearest uh, European Council, but it doesn't mean that we fixed the real problem. And the real problem is the fact that in many countries, which used to believe that they are the conscience of the European integration, the legitimization, the social support for the European integration is shrinking. And this is an important fact. We see it in the budgetary debate. It's not about the frugality, it's about lack of mandate in the parliament. We see it in an enlargement process, we see it in the neighborhood process, in the Ukraine association agreement crisis, everywhere. This is the same group of countries. And I don't want to blame any of those prime ministers because I believe they are truly pro-European. But what is happening at the back door in the parliament is something real and serious. So I think the European Union without Great Britain uh, will be not in a position to do whatever we want with our own future. I think three quarter of Brussels believe that 
EU without Britain will be easy piece of cake, because now we are free, we can do the most uh, ambitious plans for, or for federalization. And of course, Paris is, is, a, is a capital number one, using this phrase that now we are, in the end, free to do what we really dream of um, uh, for, for decades. It is, of course, not true. Uh, I think the uh, United Kingdom uh, hasn't been a country blocking the Eurozone integration. Uh, Poland isn't a country blocking at the moment the Eurozone integration. We, have, we don't want to interfere with this internal discussion. It is someone else, by the way, the same group of countries, who are definitely blocking any form of fiscal or economic integration of the Eurozone. I would agree from the academic point of view, it is true that it's hard to imagine the efficient Eurozone in the nearest um, years uh, mm, without a deeper integration. It would be logical to have a deeper fiscal integration, but the readiness to open the door for any transfers, and it comes with transfers, is, is zero. And it's not about Poland, it's not about the UK, it is internal contradiction of the Eurozone, which is present, uh, whatever will happen with the rest of the, uh, of the uh, Union. Uh, the same question to um, Sir David. How, uh, how, how you oh, feel I'm, about I mean, it? I mean, I've always supported variable geometry, and I think if, um, you know, if circles leads us in that direction, I think, that, a, I think that's healthy for European cooperation per se. I mean, leave aside the UK question, although I think it would point the way towards a, uh, a resolution of the divorce, but not for, an, for another generation. You know, I think that, that's what we, we have to look at. There's got to be a lot of development, both on the UK side and uh, the EU side, before we seriously and constructively have that sort of conversation. Um, I, if I look at the Western Balkans, I think, I'll be completely honest, I think, I think the way that North Macedonia was treated was outrageous. Um, I think Zayev took existential political risks um, in his own country, did everything that had been demanded of him, and and, and then had this um, crushing sort of slap in the face. Albania, I think you can make arguments sort of slightly more nuanced. I think Rama's done a lot, but there's obviously huge problems to come. But the Conrad made the point. I mean, the, you, know, you need unanimity at each and every stage, you know, to open a chapter, to close a chapter, needs unanimity in the council. So, you know, the, 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 the council had and would still have control over each stage of the process and could, as it has done in the past, insert new additional steps, you know, pre access or pre-chapter arrangements if the council feels it needs that kind of assurance. But if I try to put myself in Emmanuel Macron's shoes, what he's looking at is a very fragile political situation in France still. Um, that with the, the potential exception of the race in Paris at the moment, the political alternative to Macron and La République en Marche is still Le Pen. Neither the Parti Socialiste nor the Républicain are showing a serious sign of political recovery. And what are the two things that are feeding support for Le Pen and support for comparable political movements and for radical movements of the left as well as of the right in Europe? It is um, fear about the economic impact of digitization and global competition on the one hand that is upending all our assumptions about what constitutes a safe career uh, in, in the future, including white collar and professional work. This isn't just factories. Um, coupled with fear of um, it's both migration and the challenges of integrating large numbers of people from other parts of the world. And that's certainly, both those issues are potent in the French debate, but those are potent elsewhere. And if the political leaders of the EU have any sense of really wanting the EU as a project to survive, but applies to it nationally, UK and member states as well, it's showing that um, the <coughs> traditional representative democratic institutions and a liberal democracy can provide effective answers to those challenges. Because if people look at our system and think, this isn't working for me, they're going to look 
somewhere else. And I remember again and again in our referendum campaign, I was knocking on doors for Remain. And I could deploy all the economic statistics that I wanted to about benefits of the single market. And you'd often get the reply back, well, that may be your economy, but that doesn't seem to be working for me at the moment. And, and it's answering that question that is the, the, the existential challenge I think every government in Europe faces. Susan? Uh, so, I mean, I think it's perfectly reasonable to approach this question of enlargement um, as a potential pathway to differentiated membership. And it seems that would be a rational path for the EU to go down. But I think there's a number of challenges. I mean, one of the biggest challenges at the moment is around upholding values within the system once people are already members. Um, and this question around differentiated membership can't really be approached until you work out what that actually means for this values question. And if values in and out of scope, you know, how, how do we conceive of these differentiated tiers or circles or whatever we want to call them of membership? Um, it seems to me that the Article 7 process has been a failure. Um, and I think that is a huge political failure for the EU, and it is a huge question around its legitimacy to citizens as well, because I've done quite a lot of polling and surveys and so on on Article 7, and actually citizens do support those kinds of sanctions and measures and want action to be taken. Now, how that translates through the process of their nationally representative democracies and then that you know, channeling up to the council and, and to the EU is, is another thing, how those views are mediated. But I think the EU really needs to get to grips with what it's actually going to do with this and how that would apply to a differentiated membership model. I would say around identity, um, a survey that I've just done recently across the EU, I mean, you can see that uh, European identity is something that has taken hold across a, the vast majority of member states, although it is secondary to national identity. National identity remains people's foremost identity, but it's also being held in conjunction with European identity. And I think we often frame the political debate, and certainly many of the discussions in Brussels had positioning these as somehow in competition. And the idea that patriotism or national identity is somehow existentially damaging for an EU or European level identity. And I think we need to move beyond that because people will not relinquish those national identities. They will remain powerful. Um, but what we should be doing is helping people to understand how they can be held together. Well, that's Just very briefly, I, I, I guess it goes without saying that you know, EU needs move on and I guess there was no appetite for you know integration understood like you know building institutions or going deeper deeper I think in this sense federal I mean there was no federal sentiment uh, across Europe uh, never been in France and it's not even in Germany these days but so my conclusion would be that because of the external pressures we're talking about I mean, we talk about China and the US I mean the the enlargement is a good strategically smart move and I guess it's going to happen. I mean, the Western Balkans is an obvious case. Uh, I wouldn't exclude Ukraine 10, 15 years as well. But the only question is, or the problem is, that we need to try to redefine you know, what a membership really is. Because we stick to the notion of membership and the concept definition of the membership, uh, which is like you know, back from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, or even just you know, the 90s. But with this concept of membership, we won't be able just to move on. Yes, because it's about budget, because it's about common institutions. But when you look at the EU now, I mean, the, the UK is living, yes, but you've got Romania and Bulgaria, which are full members of the EU, but they are, you know, they're not part of the Eurozone, they're not part of Schengen. As you see that you have the Norway, you know, Switzerland, uh, 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 um, Iceland, Icelandic model, yes. So if you define the membership through policies, like for case in Ukraine, I guess the Ukraine is a problem that if the European Commission wants to build the fifth pillar of the single market, which is the free flow of data, which we need for the you know, industry for zero and so on and so forth, then the question is why don't we actually look at Ukraine actually as a member of 
you know, the single market understood that way, yes? Because if we don't make this move, we will have, well, Americans, that would be not a big deal, but Chinese companies actually just, yes, being in Ukraine. So I guess this is, we have to move on from the, from, 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 from the basic in terms of you know, how, what do we mean by the membership, full membership, what is the concept? And by that, I guess we can, we can uh, provide the, the, with the with, I mean, in the, in the, in the coming years, uh, a new opening. Uh, and I guess there was appetite for a success. In the end of the day, I mean, that was the story of the 90s. I mean, just, you know, Poland and other countries, we joined EU not because there was, you know, enthusiasm all over the place <laughs> to accept us, <laughs> but because there was a need, yes? I mean, there was a failure. I mean, there was a master treaty. There was a war on the Balkans, yes? There was the external oppression, the, uh, the, the solution of the Soviet Union and the threat of Americans withdrawing. And, well, I mean, and out of it, just, you know, the concept of why don't we start to, well, see how, you know, far, how deep we can go. So I think, so in this regard, I'm quite uh, optimistic that it's going to be more of an enlargement discussion than a, you know, constitutional kind of treaty uh, debate. Thank you very much. Now we will have uh, uh, time for three more questions. Hans, please. Hans Kandanani from uh, Chatham House. Um, I want to ask about the future of freedom of movement. Um, and in a way, this follows from, the, from Robin's question. Um, freedom of movement was obviously one of the factors that drove Brexit. Um, Cameron tried to re renegotiate. It didn't really get very far. And, and then we decided to leave. Um, this isn't really a concern that has been shared that much in the rest of the EU, to some extent in countries like France, in particular about Polish immigrants, in fact. Um, uh, but, but not really to the same extent as in the UK. It looked like the UK is quite exceptional in this respect. And on the other hand, Poland has always been a very strong supporter of freedom of movement. And in fact, this was one of the tensions in the UK-Polish relationship for a long time. Um, uh, but, but what seems to be happening at the same time is, is now increasing unease in the countries in Central and Eastern Europe and in Southeastern Europe that are sending people, i.e. countries like Poland, uh, about essentially an exodus of people. Uh, so, you know, unease about freedom of movement rather than because people are coming, but because people are going. Um, Elon Krastev in particular has written about this. So um, I suppose my question is really, I guess, for, for Olaf and for Minister Szymanski, um, I suppose two things. You know, given that Brexit has now happened, is the freedom of movement issue resolved um, or will this unease con continue? Um, in particular, will there be increasing unease in, in Poland and in, in 2030, Will there be complete freedom of movement within the EU, um, or will it have been restricted? Thank you very much. If there is no question from the room, uh, I would offer uh, my own now. Uh, I would like to, uh, um, I would be very much interested in how the West uh, uh, should coordinate its, its policy in this 10 time uh, 10 years time perspective, uh, particularly uh, given the fact that the European Union was a platform for uh, harmonization of responses to the, to the uh, such challenges like uh, um, Russia's uh, undermining international law, um, aggression, and uh, I mean particularly uh, here the sanctions instrument. Uh, what kind of, of vision uh, we, should, uh, we should have to coordinate uh, our policies um, of the countries on the continent, uh, still integrating in themselves within the European Union, and there is no problem uh, of shaping common stance, and the United Kingdom, which uh, would be outside of this framework, but still, uh, for many, many reasons, a very important uh, country for um, shaping uh, a free world's policy to, uh, to our financial flows, uh, markets, and, and uh, a global economy. So how we should think about this, this coordination in the future uh, with the uh, United Kingdom being outside of the EU? We should think about it as uh, ambitious as possible because we can protect our values, our interests, in the world, in this changing and challenging world, only with the unity of the West. Um, unity of the West is, of course, based on uh, EU as well, but the EU is not the only aspect. We need also NATO cooperation. We need the widest possible umbrella, which would um, project the power of the West by unity of the West. So losing UK from EU architecture means that we risk 
uh, a rebalancing of the EU situation, and it is a serious risk from Polish perspective because transatlantic, let's say, sensitivity and understanding what what is the importance of the transatlantic ties is a very important asset and contribution of the UK to the to the EU. So this. Um, uh, a losing balance in the EU means that maybe some decisions will be taken uh, more easy, but it means also that we uh, more easy would make uh, mistakes uh, because the efficiency of the decision-making system, just the technical efficiency, is the only criteria. Also, the essence, what is the product in the end, is, is equally important. So we will advocate what we advocate since the beginning, the unity of the West, whatever form will be needed. Of course, we, we, we have a, a lot of trust for more institutional form. We hear from London that institutional form of uh, foreign and security policy isn't needed because in the end the will is most important. I would agree, of course, in the end the will, even those most institutionalized form of cooperation anyway, and in time of crisis uh, leads to the coalitions of willing. It's the, uh, it's true about Europe, so, so we can continue on the base of will. But so, for some aspects, we need uh, a, a new form of cooperation, a little bit more than just uh, ad hoc uh, cooperation. I, I mean uh, a sanction policy. And both London and Warsaw use the sanction policy instruments quite actively, and I think with a good reason. We are uh, today two years after the Salisbury attack, so I think it's timely to say that there are good reasons to, to be very vigilant on sanction instruments we have. Uh, so we have to find a way how to do it, having Britain outside. On free movement, I think it's a big question because in, it, it, it is a matter of fact that we agreed, we all, 27, we agreed with David Cameron that we will offer some instruments, uh, emergency break for Britain. <coughs> to uh, suspend uh, free movement for seven years, as some other countries did just after the accession. So it was a postponed uh, transitional period for UK. It means that there's very strong fundamental approach to free movement of people as a fundamental aspect of the treaty freedoms. Um, we agreed that we can talk about it, but we wouldn't like to go too far with this uh, relativization of the importance of the free movement of people. I agree that we lost a lot of people, and this is not, in the short term, it is not a good fact for our economy and for our society, but it is somehow a principal question. We wouldn't like to affect the people's freedoms and people's choice uh, to realize their, their, their life expectations, their life uh, projections uh, this way. So we can't ag agree for any form of discrimination on the internal market. In France, we are not talking about Polish migrants. We are talking about Polish workers, a workforce, contributing to the national income more, statistically, much more than, uh, than French citizens, because they are much more active. The same in the UK. They are much more active in, in terms of uh, labor activization, uh, tax paying, um, all kind of contribution paying than, than the average. So we are not talking about just migrants. We are talking about the labor force uh, adjustments and labor market flexibility, which is needed for Europe. In the end, it's good for Europe. In, in, we understand the political uh, stake that time, that maybe with some form of limitation of this uh, un, um, unwelcomed um, freedom in UK, uh, we would make a better result with the referendum. It, it's a good argument, of course. But I believe that uh, uh, in some cases we have to confront misleading uh, perceptions. And uh, one misleading perception is the reduction of uh, membership benefits only to, re to contributions to the budget. It is a fake news because the benefits coming from the single market are much more than any contribution of any net payer around the table. And it, now I'm not talking about UK anymore. And the second thing is, of course, the, the value and the role of the free movement of people. It is a fundamental dimension of the single market, and we should be serious about uh, the social uh, fake perception about the real role of this uh, freedom for the market. Susan? Um, my name is Sophia. Oh, sorry. So, no, it's obvious. <laughs> um, 
I think on freedom of movement, I mean, I, I think in the short term, the conversation is really going to be focused on securing external borders. Um, and we can see the tremendous shift in thinking in this approach just this week um, to the situation in Greece. So I think that's that's going to be the shorter term. The, I mean, I was doing focus groups in Ukraine last year, and the one thing that they really were focused on talking about what their huge aspirations were for Ukraine and, and its future, you know, sort of within the context of a potential, potentially becoming an EU member, but also just more broadly, was freedom of movement. You know, they want to be free. And talking about the Soviet Union as a time when they couldn't move freely, they couldn't, you know. So I think it's, it's going to be politically difficult to kind of roll back from freedom of movement because it's been so critical to the EU's kind of framing of its sort of structural purpose. And just on the West, I mean, I think if you look at the big, big issues that are facing the West, so many of them necessitate cooperation. I think I am hopeful that Britain will be wanting to be an active, engaged participant in all of this. And I actually think that we are incredibly well placed to be playing quite an instrumental role in triangulating between this, between, you know, a Europe wanting to be a world global power on various things, a much more volatile and unpredictable United States. There are some issues as well that Britain, I suppose, with the space and oxygen of not being in the EU, could potentially be leading on um, even more strongly as, as you know, in its sovereign state now after Brexit. So I think that we will be playing a leading role, particularly in defense of liberal democracy, um, climate change, and so on. And I think this is where COP26 will be incredibly important for Johnson to show uh, that the sort of, he can put the meat on the bones of that global Britain vision. Thank you very much. So David. I agree very much on COP um, and on the climate change issue more, more generally. Um, I think on um, movement, I mean, what was pretty much unique about the British situation is that in the eyes of the public, free movement by EU citizens was lumped into a wider concern about um, migration of large numbers of people, whereas I think in other member states, uh, people drew a distinction between those, those two things. Um, the, uh, and and I, think the, I do think that migratory pressures will be a massive political challenge for Europe in the decades ahead. The population of sub-Saharan Africa is expected to double in the next 20 to 30 years. That's another billion people in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I mean, the idea that the, 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 these pressures are simply going to go away by, you know, a, a, another deal with whoever is ruling Turkey is, is for the birds, you know, this, this, and, and this takes into very difficult territory about you know, a 1951 UN convention and is is yeah. is that fit for the modern world? But but you know, it's worth it. you need another seminar just on that, Robin. I th I think. Um, uh, but to go to your your question about how should the West coordinate policy? Um, well, we have to use the institutions that remain: G7, um, NATO. Um, and so on, mar meetings in the margins of uh, UN General Assembly and the like. Um, but I do worry that the fact that British and uh, British ministers and ministers from other European countries and, and their officials will not be meeting week by week in the margins of council in Brussels is simply going to mean that conversations take place and decisions are reached without taking account and understanding of the other's point of view and the other's interests. And that means that it's more difficult to get mutual trust and confidence, and it's more difficult to build a coherent policy that, that serves everybody's shared interests. So I was, I'll be quite frank, I, I was disappointed that the Johnson government has, for the time being at least, rejected an institutional cooperation on uh, international policy with the EU. Um, I said I can understand the politics behind that, but I hope that that's something that um, perhaps once the, this next phase of negotiation is behind us, they will look at afresh. Because it seems to me that it's in the UK's interests to be having those regular structured conversations, not just in, in an EU context, but bilaterally with individual EU member states as well, 
to understand each other's positions. And then from London, we bring a lot to the table and we can influence a shared outcome rather than having the EU come to a formal position in, in the FAC, which is painstakingly agreed, needs unanimity. Then the, the, the UK is told, well, take it or leave it. This is our agreed position. And the UK government turns and says, oh, well, we won't consult it over that. Yeah, do your own thing. Um, you know, we'll, we'll do our own thing. There'll be a few degrees different. That's a silly way uh, to handle international relations. Oh, last intervention. Yeah, I mean, to, to, to answer Hans' question. So, well, at first, I, I do believe there's going to be a free movement of people. I mean, especially for EU citizens. I don't think if there is no major... Uh, major collapse of central uh, European economies, then actually, you know, the, the post traveling to Germany you know, will be as normal as, you know, Spaniards traveling to France or, you know, Germans to, to the Netherlands. And I think this is happening. I mean, when you look at the Polish you know, German border, there's a number of people living on the German side because it's cheaper, there's better housing, working on the Polish side. Yes, and this is something what we observe. What we may have, uh, and here the digital comes and artificial intelligence, we may have a Schengen with some digital borders if the migration pressure uh, goes. Yes, I can think that you, know, you may have some elements of borders you know, for those. I mean, for instance, you know, if Germany accepts a number of migrants, they have to stay in Germany. Yes. If they want to leave, they have to go through, legally leave, yes, they have to uh, go through certain borders, yes. So I guess there is a lot of with artificial intelligence, although we are, we are very critical about the Chinese experiment, and I agree. Well, I'm afraid we're going to uh, use a lot of this in trying, if the migration pressure is, keep, uh, is still so, so, so high. For non-EU citizens. For non-EU citizens, yeah, exactly. Yes, because that's the problem. I think the problem of EU citizens, just, you know, uh, traveling is not, a, not an issue if there is no major collapse of central uh, Eastern economies. But the migrants, it is. And on the question of services, what, what Mr. Szymanski mentioned, well, you know, there are, I mean, as always, you know, there, 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 there are two sides. Uh, on the one hand, I mean, people are very critical about, like, the post directive and all sorts of issues. And it's true. But the flip side of the coin is that, you know, there is a number of Polish companies that need the pressure, actually, to start compete with the quality, not with the price. And I think in this sense, I mean, from the Polish point of view and the point of view of Polish economy, which need to develop, this sort of, you know, pressure, you know, French, German, I mean, it's good. Of course, there, there are going to be some victims, no doubt about it. But, you know, this is the only way, actually, just you, you, you improve, you know, you, you, I mean, and this is how, actually, we, we Polish economy, I, I work now in business, so I really, you know, I sense it, yes? If there is no pressure, actually, external pressure, you know, the companies are not, especially the small and medium-sized companies. They, they, they try actually, if, if the price is fine, so why, why should it be changed, yes? But the other thing is, of course, that, you know, like with the French, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing. Uh, if the French government wants, you know, a, a, a Polish butcher to pay uh, French social insurance rather than a Polish one, it's not a problem because in the end of the day, it's the French consumer that's going to uh, uh, you know, pay a, a higher price for a steak, yes? So it depends, I mean, which companies you, you, you're talking to, but I guess... Despite all the problems, I think it's a normal process of actually, you know, countries like Poland just being, you know, developing and facing challenges which, you know, in the past that was the Portuguese, you know, Spanish uh, uh, experience. So I'm quite optimistic about it. Thank yes. you very much. Just short reaction. Mm -hmm. Yes. Of course, it is pretty obvious that we don't want to compete with prices. It's a, it is an old story, not, not relevant anymore. All sectors active in the internal market are uh, playing and uh, are competitive with quality. What we are uh, opposing strongly, we just went to the court with this posting of workers directive and, and mobility package will be the same, is artificial protective uh, clauses which doesn't create any better standards in terms of social and labor protection. It's just this is just the, uh, cutting the market into pieces. And the services market isn't completed anyway. And we are, when we see the tendency to move back, it is a threat because the services is the most important potential for economic growth across the EU. And this is simply unfair. Thank you very much. This was a, a fascinating uh, panel about the future of Europe. And actually, we managed to talk about this unpredicted, unpredictable uh, future in the way uh, which um, uh, inform us what kind of the factors may influence this, this future and how we should think about uh, also the social dimension um, um, in it. 
uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to um, uh, all of you to join me in rising in applause and thanking our members of the panel for excellent discussion.